Good morning. I'd like to add my welcome to you. I was encouraged to come and share my story, but I think you just heard it. Thank you for your interest in dentistry and for being here today. I live in Folsom, as Harmon said, which is about a 45-minute drive east of here. I think my most memorable visit to Davis so far was a few years ago when I went to a little airstrip on the west side out in the fields, got in an airplane, went up to 14,000 feet, and jumped. It was incredible. It was a clear day like today, and we could see the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and Lake Tahoe at the same time. And to top it all off, I had a cute guy strapped to my back. <laughs> so we did a free fall for about a minute and dropped to 5,000 feet. And what I've never figured out is how did the video guy get positioned right in front of us? But all of a sudden, there he was, and he was trying to get me to smile for the camera. And I thought, I'm not going to open my mouth because it feels like you're going down the freeway at, at 100 miles an hour and you put your, your head out the window. The, the air is so strong, I thought, if it goes in, it's just going to blow me up. You've probably seen the video of the lady who was skydiving, and she was laughing, and her denture came floating out. <laughs> So I felt like something from a bug's life. I had this little helmet around, little soft hat around my head and goggles. And I would show you the pictures, but I destroyed them all. <laughs> Wasn't my most beautiful presentation. So when we got to 5,000 feet, we opened the parachute and just glided gently down to the ground. And did I mention I had a cute guy strapped to my back? So I learned a couple of things from that jump. First, if you're at all interested, you should do it. Don't let a fear of heights hold you back, because no one is more afraid of heights than I am. One of our local malls has glass panels on the second story walkway. And I always hug the storefronts, because if I get too close to the edge where I can look over, my stomach starts to do flip-flops. But if you jump out of an airplane that's already going 120 miles an hour, it just feels like you're floating. You don't have that sensation like if you're jumping off a bridge or a stationary object. The other thing that I learned from my jump master is that it's best to go first. If you watch someone else jump out of the plane, your stomach will get those queasy moments. So I didn't even tell my husband, who jumped right after me. I just volunteered to go first. And he told me later that it was really hard to watch me go out the door and disappear. So don't hesitate to follow your dreams, to take the jump. Often your fears are unfounded. And go first. Be a leader. That was not the first time that I was first at something. I'm a firstborn. That comes with its own set of characteristics. And I was also first in my family to enter a healthcare profession. I grew up in a logging camp on an island in Alaska. We had no dentists, no physicians. I think we had one nurse in camp. We didn't have phones or TVs or stores. Our groceries came once a month on the grocery boat. My middle brother and I tried to convince my younger brother that he came on the grocery boat too, that Fred McKay, the captain of the boat, was his father, and now we wonder why he's been so traumatized. <laughs> but we had a rich life. We lived off the land and ate a lot of fish and a lot of venison. We were homeschooled. Some years we had one or two teachers for all eight grades in camp, so we had to be independent learners. When I was starting junior high, we moved about 30 miles away to the town of Ketchikan. Today, it's a port of call for the cruise ships, so make sure you put it on your list of, a place, of places to visit in the summer. Ketchikan has an average rainfall of 14 feet a year, but on a clear day, actually even on a rainy day, the scenery is spectacular. When I was 15, a friend of my parents asked me if I would be interested in working in his dental office after school. 
And I didn't, I didn't really have a clear vision or, or actually any vision of a career path at that time. I knew I would go to college because my parents told me that it was my decision, but I had to go to college. I thought working in people's mouths sounded gross, but after lots of encouragement, I decided to try it. And today, well, I cut gums for a living. I was fortunate to work with a compassionate and, and skilled dentist who mentored me and encouraged me. When I graduated from high school, I left home from my dad's alma mater, which was the University of Idaho, and entered the pre-dental program. At that time, there were only one or two women per class in dental school. And my college counselor told me that women go into dental hygiene, honey. So not knowing any better at the time, I applied to dental hygiene programs. I got my bachelor's degree in dental hygiene from Idaho State University and returned to Alaska to work. My path led me to an office where I worked with a dentist who had lost his right hand. He was flagging some high power lines on his property so that his friends wouldn't hit them with their airplanes. And he slipped and grabbed a live wire and got 7,500 volts down his right hand, his right arm, and into his groin. So his right arm was amputated and he had a hook for a prosthesis, which worked great for retracting cheeks. <laughs> And then I got to utilize my skills in expanded functions. So he retrained himself in just a few months, actually, to use the handpiece with his left hand. And I would start by getting his patients numb. He would do the cavity preparations. And then I would place and finish the fillings. So I kept thinking about dental school. And I also had an interest in education. I learned about a master's degree program in oral biology at the University of Washington. It was designed to train hygienists in basic sciences like anatomy and pathology and it increased the pool of instructors for hygiene programs. So I was accepted to the program and after finishing my master's was recruited to teach in a program in Kentucky. I never thought I'd live in Kentucky. I wasn't there very long when a dental school recruiter came to the campus and in my conversation with him, he asked me, why aren't you in dental school? And he handed me an application. I went through the process and interviewed and ended up choosing the University of the Pacific Arthur A. Dagoni School of Dentistry in San Francisco. By the time I entered dental school, there were about 30% women in each class. I think today, Dr. Valakovic didn't mention it, but today I believe the classes are uh, close to 50% or just over 50% women. During the time that I was in dental school, I was involved in leadership roles with the American Dental Association, the American Association of Dental Schools, now known as ADEA, the organization that Dr. Valakovic is with. I became the vice president of students and sat on the executive committee with deans and faculty from schools around the country. That led to an appointment as the student representative of CODA, the Commission on Dental Accreditation. So again, as a dental student, I sat at the table with deans from dental schools across the country, and we discussed and established the requirements for dental education and dental auxiliary programs. I'll never forget my first meeting. I was in my third year of dental school, and I had just finished those national boards that Dr. Valakovic talked about, a two-day written exam, drove from the exam to the San Francisco airport and flew to Chicago. I got to Chicago about midnight and drove, took a taxi to downtown Chicago. The taxi driver fell asleep on the way to the hotel and drove off the edge of the freeway. I was pretty startled. I was alone in a big city that I wasn't familiar with and it was kind of terrifying. But we made it to the Ritz Carlton and when I walked into the room and I saw that poofy bed and the nice plush robe and the chocolates on my pillow, I thought, okay, I can do this. 
I've been fortunate to travel all over the country with my leadership roles in dentistry, and I've made many wonderful friends. So I encourage you to get involved and get involved now. Well, nearing the end of my dental school training, I began to explore what would be next on my journey. I had fallen in love with a classmate in dental school, even though I promised myself that I would never marry a dentist. <laughs> he was headed to San Antonio to train in periodontics, and I was accepted into a fellowship in stomatology or oral medicine at Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas, a five-hour drive from San Antonio. When I finished that program, I decided that specializing in periodontics would make sense. Periodontists treat gum disease, which is a chronic infection of the gum and bone around teeth and can lead to tooth loss. So we do bone grafts, we do uh, gum tissue grafts, we remove failing, hopeless teeth and place implants, and we treat diseases of the oral soft tissues in the mouth. So I thought my dental hygiene training, plus my dental, my oral pathology, oral medicine training, would all be able to be applied in periodontics. So I married the dentist, moved to San Antonio, and started a residency in periodontics, a year behind my husband. When we finished our training, we moved back to California and started a practice together, had a couple kids, not too long after I came back to California, I read a notice in a newsletter from CDA, the California Dental Association, that there were openings on councils and committees, and anyone interested should contact them. So I did. I let them know that I was interested, and that began my leadership career with the California Dental Association. I eventually ran for the office of treasurer, a position which led up the ladder to the presidency. There had never been a woman in that position, and that was the year 2000. I even received anonymous letters and phone calls that I was not qualified, but the vote was almost unanimous. Being on the executive committee was a second full-time job, but it's so rewarding. The places that I went, the opportunities that I had, the friends that I made have left with me with great memories. I was president of CDA in 2004, and I've continued to be active in local, state, and national uh, associations. And so as you get ready to take that jump into a, a career in health care, first start with an education. Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. How true is that? Although the investment in knowledge is getting more costly, I know, kid number four just graduated from college this summer, but the opportunities are so much greater with an education. In healthcare, there are several levels of training and corresponding job responsibilities. I think I had just about every rung on the career ladder in dentistry, from dental assistant to dental hygienist, educator, researcher, dentist, and specialist. It's taken a lot of work, and it continues to be a lot of work. Healthcare is demanding. It's never ending, and it's exhausting. And then you go home to take care of your family. And the face of healthcare is changing. We're not sure what it will look like when you start working and practicing. Many things will be different, as Dr. Valakovic mentioned. Will we have government-funded health care? Will there truly be affordable insurance for everyone? How will we be regulated? By who? You will be less likely to work in a solo practice like I do, the practice model of the future is moving toward group and group specialty practices, which makes sense because treatment is becoming much more multidisciplinary across more than one specialty. Likewise, the planning and coordination of treatment is more complex, and communication among providers is vital. 
you have the advantage of being comfortable with technology and being in constant communication. That was something I had to learn on my own. When I first started texting, I kept putting LOL on the end of every message to my children. <laughs> Finally, one of them said, you know, that means laugh out loud. I said, <laughs> so who came up with that? I thought it meant lots of love. <laughs> But here's what I can do today for my patients. We can take a CT scan, a 3D digital image of their jaws, plug it into a treatment planning software, which helps me determine exactly where I want to place dental implants to avoid structures like sinuses and nerves. And then I can order a computer print of a surgical guide, an appliance that will fit in the patient's mouths with little channels to guide the placement exactly where we want it. How cool is that? It's a rapidly growing technology and it'll be part of everyday practice for you. I want to offer you some aspirations as you embark on a healthcare career. First, be a lifelong learner with rapidly advancing technology it will take a concerted effort to keep up with the changes and implement them into your practice. Be compassionate, be patient, and listen. Your patients won't care so much about where you went to school or how much you know. They won't be able to determine how skilled you are, but they will know how much you care. Be ethical. And don't ever, ever, ever compromise what is best for your patients. Be involved in your profession. Be a leader. Don't let others regulate how you treat your patients. Be humble and give back. No matter what our healthcare delivery system looks like, looks like there will always be a need because it's not just based on economic factors. There are cultural factors. There are geographic factors. There's a lack of providers for all the care that's needed. I'm thankful for the skills I have and the opportunity to use them. But I don't heal people. But I'm blessed to be a facilitator and to be able to touch lives and make a difference. The greatest rewards don't come from using the latest technology. Well, that's exciting. What makes it all worthwhile is to help someone less fortunate, a homeless person who's been living without hope, in pain, most likely addicted. When you can show them compassion, get them out of pain, give them a simple appliance so they can eat and smile and restore their self-worth, it makes it all worthwhile. So take the jump and go first. Best wishes to you. <laughs>